coming up with Jihad Cola as the beverage right. of choice <laughs> right. gave me immense pleasure. And, you know, automobiles that, that always have a, a thing in them that directs you to Mecca, right. which I thought was brilliant on my part. And then a year ago I saw that there's a, a, an auto manufacturer in Singapore who's doing exactly right. that. Um, so I, I enjoyed most of it, but, you know, you to really make the place work, there's, like you say, there's tons of details that it requires. And, you know, I, uh, the trick for me was not to get bogged down in the details. In other words, make it 90% of just the way things are now. And I, it, but it's the 10% that makes all the difference. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the things that I used for that is, that to be made sense, was in an Islamic America, change, innovation, all these things that, that make our world change, bam, 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 are going to be slowed down immeasurably. Sure. I mean, the gross national product of, of Arabic countries, I know. other than oil, is about as much as like, you know, Birmingham, Alabama yeah. or something. Yeah. There's, they, there's nothing produced other than children and oil. Right. So it made sense that all the really good techie stuff in my world is imported from China or Russia or Switzerland right. because they still innovate. But in, in the U.S. as we know it, um, the change has, has slowed and in fact atrophied. I have lots of scenes of you know, the highways falling apart, bridges collapsing, right. uh, because those are not valued. Right. I went to a seminar by a man who was an expert in um, in the use of blades. He okay. essentially, one of his jobs, he teaches Navy SEALs how to kill people with, with right. knives. And, and he went over various killing techniques and he had one of his, you know, his associates and he would do things like, do these series of moves and he'd say, now how many times, and it would take like a second and a half, how many times, how many cuts did I make, how many killing cuts did I make on this guy? And you know, we would guess, and I would, you know, I was, I would double what I right. saw and say eight, and then he would slow it down, and there'd be like thirteen. Wow. He had, you know, killed this man thirteen different times in a second and a half. Right. He he taught me this technique, which is really interesting, and I'd never heard of it. He says, when you're sneaking up on someone, you never want to sneak up on them directly and you never want to even look at the back of their head or the back of their neck. it'll draw their attention. He said even though they're looking that way and you're coming up from behind, they will feel your right. eyes on That's them. right. And I just thought that's that's really that's really good because when you most of us would think you keep your you keep your target, you know, in sight, but in fact he said your eyes sweep laterally back and forth and, and you 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 approach obliquely. So I, I first interviewed Elmore Leonard when I was a reporter for a newspaper in Southern California and I, I left at the chance because he was one of my heroes, I'm a right. huge fan of his work. So I go to his hotel room and, and I'm nervous and my voice is cracking and uh, I, I give the worst interview of my life. I'm Because I'm so in awe of him, the, my questioning fluctuates between being sycophantish and being insulting. I mean, I catch myself kind of kissing his butt, and then I go, oh, no, I have to, you know, so I ask him something that's really rude. And, and, and it was just like this painful thing, and I, afterwards I was like so embarrassed that I, I said, you know, Mr. Leonard, I, 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 we're working on a book, and I've been working on it forever, and um, here's, here's some of my writing. And I just gave him a published piece, because you can't give a, a writer yeah. anything that's unpublished because they worry about lawsuits. But this was a piece I had done for the newspaper, two-part piece on um, a spy, a, a CIA agent who would come in, and I, it was a, the best thing I had ever done. And I was embarrassed, and he was gracious enough to take it. And I said, if you, if you like it, let me know. I, I would appreciate it. I, I got uh, a, a letter from him like a day later. He had read it on the plane loved it and encouraged me in my writing, said, you know, if you ever get that book finished, I'd be happy to read it in terms of a blurb, wow. which he did when the book came, you know, when I was sending the book out, um, had a publisher, and first, first chance I sent it to him, and he gave me a great blurb. Right. But he's uh, amazing. <laughs> to me, I, would have, I wouldn't have read anything from a guy who gave such a bad interview. But. This is the advice Elmore Leonard gave to me, which was that you, you can't write on the weekends. 
you have to write every day. If that means getting up at 5 a.m. when you normally get up at 7, that's what you do. You need at least an hour and a half a day of uninterrupted writing. Almost always it works better at the beginning of the day. You do it every day. Then on the weekend you can rewrite. But you can't wait to the weekend to do your writing because it takes you too long to pick up the, the threads that you left off the previous weekend. Had you ever tried to write that way? I did. I, I wasted. I didn't waste, but at the end of two years, I had a really great one chapter. <laughs> and uh, after Elmore Leonard gave me that advice, uh, within six months, I had half a book. Uh, so, I, but again, he got up, you know, an hour and a half early. I got up three hours early because I figured he was a lot better writer. <laughs> than I, was, so I needed the extra hour and a half.